What's up, peoples? Um, I think I mentioned this in the end of my last video, but um, as is kind of par for the course this summer, it's uh, rain. Oop, bump the camera. It's raining for like five more straight days, so I'm kind of forced to find other things to work on on the boat. So if you haven't already noticed, these are uh, trim solenoids. So I, I uh, finished up the battery and trim pump mounts and decided that my trim pump's been sitting in the shed ever since I bought the boat and uh, just kind of sitting there. So I figured I'd take advantage of the weather to do some work on the, uh, the old bench here. So the purpose of this video is going to be some sort of a combination of trim solenoid maintenance, uh, how to clean them up, maintain them, and also how to test them. As far as I know these work, I believe I tested the, the trim when I bought the boat and everything was fine, but again, it's been sitting in my shed, so you never know, maybe maybe one of them corroded up or something, so I'm just going to give them the rundown to make sure they're working properly, clean them up, and in that process I figured I'd take a video and kind of document how to do that, so... With that being said, um, there's some kind of pieces and parts scattered around here, the actual pumps over here off the camera, which I'm waiting to get some uh, new pickup screens for that, so maybe I'll do a video on that at some point. Um, but I took these things off of the bracket um, that the mount or the pump was mounted to, and I kind of gave them a quick dousing of engine degreaser and hosed them off and let them get some time to dry. Um, so that got most of the residue off, but you can still see there's a lot of dirt and stuff on, on the, the nuts and the posts and the wires and all that kind of stuff. So the first thing I'm gonna do here and what I actually started doing here with some of these random pieces of hardware is basically just cleaning off any more than I can. So when the plastic pieces all come through with a rag and some maybe some degreaser and get off anything else that I didn't get. Trim solenoids, but more importantly, on the metal pieces, um, because this is electrical, obviously, I want to make sure I get all the dirt and grime and corrosion off of that. So I'm gonna kind of go at this. Um, I'll probably do it off camera because there's really nothing I can say while I'm doing it. In terms of tools, just some rags, maybe a, uh, a brass bristle brush or something. That's hard to say. Brass bristle brush. Um, to clean up the electrical components and stuff like that. So let me do that real quick and uh, show you what it looks like afterwards. Be right back. Welcome back. All right, I don't know how well this is gonna show up on camera, but as you can see, I took all these, basically everything apart that I could. There's this brass bus bar, brass, nuts, uh, lock washers, everything. This. Um, self-threading screw which goes into this bus bar holds this plastic clip on it's yeah whatever basically just took everything apart I could took all the wires off the solenoids here cleaned up the the copper screws maybe autofocus no just kidding cleaned up these copper screws that the bigger wires go to and the smaller terminals clean those up as well I mean you could go nuts on this just trying to get all the grease off but at that point, it's basically just cosmetic. Main thing is you want to clean up these terminals best you can. Obviously, while you're at it, you want to inspect, make sure there's no cracks in the plastic or anything like that. Um, as these do probably get pretty hot. There's a lot of current going through these. Anyway, <clears throat> got that all cleaned up. Cleaned off these terminals on the ends of the, the harness here. Um, so the next thing I want to do is... For my own sanity and also to show you guys how to do it is test these solenoids to make sure both of them are working properly um but before i do that i thought maybe it'd be a good idea to kind of test my uh, artistry skills which are horrible to show you kind of what these things actually do how they work um and that i think that will give you guys a better understanding of one what you're doing when you're testing them and two if you ever do kind of break down where the trim solenoids stop working you can kind of understand what to do to bypass it in a kind of an emergency situation so um let's set these aside and uh 
break out the, the drawing board here. Like I said, I'm no artist, so give me a break. <clears throat> um, okay. So really, when I say a solenoid, really what this is is basically a relay, kind of interchangeable term in terms of how these work. So what's going on here is we have, oops, my nuts are all over the place. So what's going on in here is you have, let me draw a battery and a solenoid, which Okay, and then uh, do, do, do. And let's just draw this for lack of a better term. Okay, so now let's even get super creative in colors. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna go ahead and draw from the positive wire. To that terminal and then also coming off to so this would actually be going to the motor so I'll draw that too so this is the trim motor put TM and this is the wires so technically you have two of these but what's going on is the same thing on the other on the other one but it's actually reversed if that makes sense so a trim pump is basically just a DC motor. Um, it works. To reverse it, you basically just switch the leads. Um, okay. So now, off the ground, I'll just draw this back here. Okay. So ignoring all this, right now what we have is basically the positive wire from the battery to this contact, and then from this contact to the trim pump motor and the ground going back to the battery. Um, but as you can see, there's no way for the current to complete this circuit. So what's going on here is we're splitting off the ground there, we'll say. And then when we also have a wire going to this point. Okay, so bear with me here. We're going back to physics 101 here in terms of, or I guess electronics, whatever you want to say. Okay, so if you don't know how a relay works, you basically have a coil of wire, which is what this is. And if you put current through a coil of wire, it basically creates a magnetic field. Um, and there's, I can go into tons of detail here, but basically what's going on <coughs> is you have current flowing through and this is actually there be a switch in the middle here which is actually your your trim switch at to your, your uh, throttle control but just assuming we're pushing for example say trim up right now and that switch is closed so what's going on is current is flowing from the battery through this coil and back out to ground and back to the battery we have a complete circuit and what happens is that coil or the current flows through this coil and when current's flowing through that coil creates a magnetic field and what happens is this rod in the middle of this field is attracted to that magnet so what it does is moves up <clears throat> so let's draw the closed condition in blue Like I said, don't judge my artist skills. So when you hit the switch at the throttle control, current goes through this coil, creates a magnetic field, and this magnetic rod in this inside this coil is attracted to that magnet, shoots up, and these contacts basically close, which creates, connects this circuit and the power of the trim motor. And like I said, for up or down, the theory is basically the same. It's just all it's doing is internally it's basically switching the leads on the motor and reversing them to make the motor spin in reverse. So it's actually really simple. If you look at the actual solenoid, 
um, what's actually going on here is these two coil wires are actually these two smaller leads. That's the idea. It takes a small amount of current to switch a large amount of current. So you have their two small leads which control the coil, and then the two larger leads are these big contacts here. So you might be asking why do this versus just literally controlling it with the switch. There's already a switch up at the throttle controller, but there's a couple of reasons why you would do something like this. Um, and if you work in any kind of industry, this is already common knowledge. But um, one of the biggest reasons is the wires that go to these terminals for the trim pump are decently large wires. Um, I think the main fuse for the trim pump is like 100 amps or something like that. So it has to carry a lot of current and to carry a lot of current you need big wire and then in order to do that that means you would have had to run large gauge wire all the way from back where the trim pump is all the way up to the throttle controller and on a bigger boat that's that could be a 20 30 foot run of cable and then all the way back for the ground wire so it's basically just saves you the need to run a lot of copper long distances on the boat which is expensive um, so by doing that you can run these small gauge control wires because this coil doesn't need very much current to close that switch. Um, other reasons you do it are you can get into more complex of these where you can have a normally open, normally closed. There's a lot of variations of essentially relays. Um, that and they're, they're reliable. Um, and in addition, if you wanted to control it with just a switch, I mean, you would need a really beefy switch. So the reason this works is because the magnetic force that closes that switch actually closes that switch with enough force to actually give you really good solid contact. Um, to make a switch that would give you that type of connection, it would be very difficult to like actuate it, if that makes sense. Um, and just for example, I mean, this is this would appear to be a really large switch that seems like maybe that could handle it, and it might. Um, but I mean, just for reference, the rating on the switch is only 16 amps. So I mean, you got to put that in perspective. 16 amps for this. This is taking over 100 amps. So I mean, it it starts to all kind of add up as to why they actually do this. Um, so that being said, let's move on to, now that we understand what's actually going on inside of it, how do we actually test it? So just looking at this diagram and kind of translating to what's going on in here, one thing you would obviously want to check for is if you look at these two big terminals, when there's no current going through this coil, then this should obviously be open. So if we were to take a multimeter and check from here to here, there should be no continuity. If there is, no good. Um, so let's uh, let's make that our first check. I got my multimeter here, and I have no idea if these are good or not. So we're going to find this out together. So I'm going to set my multimeter to the continuity setting. So when it touches, it beeps. So let's check. Nothing good. And that's and yeah, I didn't bring that up. I will now. You want to clean this before you do this test if you're if you're going to go through the hassle of cleaning these contacts up, which I recommend. Um, because if you don't, if there's a lot of corrosion on here or gunk, if I do this, it might show open circuit, but that doesn't mean it is. I might just not be getting a good connection from my test leads. So now that this is nice and clean, I can know for sure that that means that's open. Uh, let's check the other one. And I will mention that if you actually look at the underside of these, they're actually exactly the same part. The the ID number is the same, which makes sense. It's just a relay, so same thing. Now I don't remember which one I already checked, so I'll just check them both. No continuity. No continuity. Good. Okay. So now that we've checked that, let's go back to our diagram and think about what else we can check. So the next thing we can see is this coil is a continuous circuit and therefore should have some level of resistance to it. It shouldn't be open circuit, but it shouldn't be short circuit. Now there's probably actually resistance values published somewhere from Mercruiser on what the values should be. 
um, but just as a, a quick check, if we set the meter to resistance, which is, yeah, it's an auto range, but when I test across here, and it doesn't matter which way you test, we're just going to get a resistance value. Now, if it shows open line or open circuit like it does now, we know that that coil is open inside and no good. If it shows like less than 0.23 ohms, I would also say that it's no good. It sounds like it would be shorted out. I'm guessing this is going to be somewhere around 5 to 20 ohms. That's just my guess at this point. Okay, 6 ohms. That seems about right. Um, the, the lower current or smaller these coils are, typically the higher the resistance is on this because you don't need as much current in that coil to create a high enough magnetic force. Um, but because I know this thing takes a good bit of current, I, that's why I was able to guess that the resistance on this coil is going to be pretty low. And what we really want to see here also, since I don't know what the actual value is, is that they're going to be close to each other. And those are dead on, they're both 5.96 ohms, which is perfect. Okay, let's move this aside. And looking at our diagram again, just trying to think what else we could test. So we tested the coil, we know there's continuity in there. We tested these contacts in its unenergized state and saw that there's no continuity, which is good. The only thing that's really left there to check, well, I say only thing, but based on how this is constructed, I don't think you could ever get a failure mode like this, but in some cases on relays or solenoids, you can actually get a case where the coil or these contacts end up getting shorted to the outside case. And some are actually that way on purpose. Sometimes there's only one stud here because the other one is connected to the ground or the case and grounded through the case. But in this case, I don't believe that is how it is set up. But just for curiosity, let's check. So I'm just testing for continuity between any of these posts in this metal case to make sure nothing's shorted internally. And if I do get a short, like I said, I'm not 100% sure that that's how these are set up. But the fact that this looks like it's crimped on at the factory as a base makes me think that it's not wired to it. So. That one I didn't get any continuity between any of the posts in the case. Yeah, nothing there either. So that tells me no issues internally. Um, now the last thing we're gonna check is the actual function of these. Now this isn't gonna be checkable. You can't really check this with just a multimeter. You're also gonna need a power source, which doesn't make it really that difficult. It could be a 12 volt battery out of the boat. Could be a nine volt battery would probably be enough to actuate this. Um, in my case, I don't have a 12 volt battery down here or a power supply, but what I do have is an old wall wart, which is rated to 12 volts, 300 milliamps, which should be more than enough to open that coil, or to open the, move the coil, I guess I should say. So, let me show you what you can do here, it is, I like to use these alligator clips, just kind of helps hold things together. So I'm just going to clip one on one, one on the other. In this case, there's a white stripe on one and not on the other, but what I found doing this stuff before, oops, can't really see what's going on here. So this one wire has a white stripe on it, the other one's got nothing. So I always assume and it's usually the case that the one that has a white stripe on it is positive, but just to double check, got this hooked up. I'm going to put my multimeter in DC volts. I'm going to go ahead and plug this into my power strip and see what we get. Making sure nothing's touching, hopefully. Okay, yeah, polarity is right. So, so I, I know this is showing 18.96 volts, but that's kind of the problem with these crappy cheap wall warts is they're very poorly regulated internally. Um, it'll actually drop down to 12 volts once there's actually a load on it, which is what we're going to do here in a second. So now that we've verified the polarity, we know 
that the one with the white stripe is positive. So I'm just going to clamp a red alligator clip on there, and a black one on the other. And now I'll put red on one, and I'm not going to clip this on yet, only because I want to be able to control it kind of manually here, if that makes sense. So I'm going to plug this in, and everything's hooked up now except for this negative alligator clip. So what I'm going to do is touch it. I want to clamp it on there because I don't know if this wall work can handle the current it's going to need for this or not. But I'm just going to basically touch it quickly, not quickly, but for a second or two to this. And you'll actually, if it's good, you'll hear a clicking noise. And that's actually the relay internally. That's that magnetic field being creative and physically pulling this rod up and making that contact. So what we're going to do is touch this, and if we hear a click, then we'll move on. If we don't, then we'll make sure all our connections are good, make sure we have voltage and all that stuff, and tr troubleshoot from there. But this should work. So here we go. Yep. So you hear that click? That's a good sign. So I'm going to test the other one here. So that one's good. And just to show you a point here, it actually doesn't matter the polarity on these. Um, you're basically creating magnetic field and the rod that's in there is steel. So it doesn't care which pole it is. It's not like the rod is a magnet and it's gonna go the wrong way. So you can actually technically run these either way, but I would still recommend wiring it the way your Mercruiser diagram shows or how it was originally set up. Okay. So now that we have this plugged in, I'm going to leave the wall warp plugged in. So these are both connected right now. we got positive and negative. So now that we know it's clicking, I'm going to try and do this with one hand. I got my multimeter over here. And I'm going to set it to continuity again. So once again, if we touch the leads, we get a beep telling us that we have a connection. So here is the true functional test. Again, I'm going to try and do this one-handed. So I have a lead on each of the big, large copper posts, and I'm going to do what I just did a second ago. And when this clicks, we should get continuity, so my meter should beep. And we're not. So that would make me believe that there might be an issue with this one. So functionally, everything checked out before, but now I'm not getting continuity. Oh, now I am. So I'm thinking maybe I just had a bad connection here on my multimeter probes. Hmm. Still nothing. So I mean that, like I said, I haven't tested this before, so there's a chance this solenoid is a little flaky. do here is actually switch this to resistance okay so I'm getting 180 kilo ohms on my meter here which is very high resistance which is no bueno um, let's go ahead and just for curiosity sake switch these and make sure that these are not polarized which I don't believe is the case yeah still getting a high resistance about 125 kilograms okay so what that tells me is this one is not not gonna work in this particular case. Let's move over to the other one and check it and see if we get the same results. If we do, then I might be a little suspicious that my test is no good, but um, this should work if the solenoid is good. So let's go back to continuity. Still good there. Okay, got my test leads on the posts. So 
this one appears to be working. I think there was still some amount of corrosion on it because I'm still getting about eight ohms or so. It's actually slowly dropping though, which is kind of odd. It starts out around 12 ohms, dropping down eight. It's still kind of high, but it is a little better than the last one. So what that tells me is the internal contacts, these things, might have a lot of corrosion on them, build up and scale from kind of arcing and stuff over time. So it's probably gonna be in my best interest to just replace these. Um, the, uh, honestly, the, the resistance from here to here, which is what I was checking on these posts, it should be really low, basically. The equivalent of touching these together, which, well, actually I wonder if my test leads are no good. That's actually pretty high resistance. Let me uh, investigate my meter and make sure it's not junk. Be right back. Alright, um, meter seems to be fine. I set it to the resistance meeting, touched the probes together, and it was giving me like 0.34 ohms. So, that, that seems in the ballpark. My thought is those contacts inside of there are probably getting to be shot or just too corroded. Um, the guy I bought this boat from, he did boat in brackish water in Chesapeake, so there's a chance that uh, these things might just be beyond their life. But, if I'm going to throw them out anyway and replace them, I'm a little curious here as to if these are at all repairable. So it looks like when they make these from the factory, they have this molded plastic housing and they shove these posts through the holes. And then it looks like they put this base plate on to just kind of hold the assembly together and then cramp, the, cl uh, crimp these four fingers around the outside. So I'm gonna see what happens if I can, if I can, bend these fingers open and get this metal base off. If I can get this assembly to come out, I might be able to get to the contacts that touch these and just clean them off with some sandpaper or scotch brite. I mean, if they're just built up with corrosion, that may actually work. So. Let's see if I can uh, do anything with these. I'll be back in a minute. All right, so I'm not gonna recommend you do this on your boat. Um, if you do this test and you get the same results that I did that the resistance was pretty high, just replace the solenoids. It's not worth it. Um, when you get this clip off, which is actually, it was reasonably easy to do, there's a gasket underneath, and then all that you can really see is the underside of this piece here. And then there's two real small magnet wires coming out that are crimped to a ferrule, and then they're actually resistance welded to these contacts in here, which are actually just the studs that come through to these threaded posts here. So, that Unless you can solder that back on and be confident that it's going to be a good connection. I mean, you already have that going against you. And then in addition, once you pull this thing out, I mean, you can you can actually see the bottom side of these two copper contacts down there. Maybe. One's like just totally black. The other one looks okay. There's some, uh, there's some kind of welding marks where it was sparking. So that is obviously the cause for that high resistance number. Um, but it was at least fun to take the thing apart and kind of show you what's going on inside. So, like I said, there's your two contact points, which are these, which we drew. And then the bottom half of that contact is actually just a large copper disc, which has a post on the back that goes down inside of this coil, which is basically just an electromagnet. So, just for tits and pickles, let's show you what goes on here. If anything, you can make a <laughs> fun little toy out of that. So that post just sits down inside of there, and when you put the coil current to the coil, like we said, draws it up. So what would what would be happening is this would be shooting up, and this would make contact with the underside of those two posts there, and make that connection. But obviously, what's going on here is this piece is just totally corroded. It's black. This is copper. It should be copper colored. And same with the one post in there, so this thing I think is just beyond repair. 
I may just kind of mess around with it just to see from my own curiosity, but even to get in there, you'd probably have to try and press this post out, and that may break the housing, I don't know. Um, eh, we'll see what we can do, but I think I'm probably going to wrap the video up here. I mean, that gives you a good understanding of how to test them. Um, shows you kind of how they work, what's going on inside of them, and really just kind of how to clean them and maintain them. So, yep, we're going to end it here. In the next video, I may show you some work I'm doing on the trim pump. There's real, I'm actually not going to do much of anything to it other than just some cleaning it and replacing these metal pickup screens because it was busted. If you can see that, it's actually missing a piece. So, got those on order and throw those on but other than that probably not gonna do much to it i may show putting the whole assembly back together with the solenoids and the bracket and everything but uh beyond that i think that's gonna do it for this one guys um hopefully you found this helpful and might get you out of a jam if you ever find yourself where your trim pump's not working because of a solenoid the uh i'll give you the the main takeaway from that is what you want to do in that case is what would happen here is I wouldn't be getting good connection from one side to the other. So if I needed to say screw that, I need my trim to go up or down. Take a screwdriver while this is in the boat. Short out those two. It's going to spark a little. Don't be freaked out. But once you do that, you're basically bypassing that and allowing current to flow from one side to the other, which will activate the trim pump motor and uh, get you out of a pickle. So just remember that part, if anything. All right, guys, hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, and once the rain stops, we'll get back on the actual boat and uh, start getting things put in. So we'll catch you next time. See you.